I am here with the great Steve Kornacki. Uh, he's, of course, the national political correspondent of NBC News and MSNBC. He's the host of podcast The Revolution, best-selling author, one of People Magazine's sexiest man alive. Um, he is kind of everybody's uh, plush toy on election night, makes us all feel comfortable and safe and knowledgeable. He's become kind of a national treasure and an internet sensation. Steve, thanks for being here, man. Uh, Donnie, that's that's really kind, and I, I've I've never been told I make people feel safe before, so I, I kind of like that. Well, it is, you know, it's it, it, particularly in the last couple of elections, it's particularly stressful for people. You know, you, there's a lot on the line. We, we everybody knows that ad nauseum, and, and whether it's abortion or democracy or you know, major major things, and there's something you have this. Although you're doing this frenetic thing, it's such a calming way because. You're so trustworthy. You're so on top of it that it it calms a little bit. I actually kind of noticed when you come on the screen beyond leaning in, for me, it relaxes me a little bit. Like, okay, everything's okay. Kornacki's here, you know? Uh, I, I love it. I'll take it. So what do you think, if you're going to do a little self-analysis, that in, in the 2020 election puts you it really in as a sensation? You just It just hit a nerve. Uh, I, I mean, the R, everything from Leslie Jones ending up with a tremendous crush on you. I know you recently did the Daily Show to articles written over you to, uh, you know, as I said, being known as this 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 uh, heartthrob. What do you think happened? Why do you think is if you're going to do a self-analysis, what what happened? What nerve has, have you hit? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess the old line is there's no accounting for taste. So right. there's, there's <laughs> probably something there. Um I, you know, I, I, I just, it was a weird election. Uh, it is one word. There's many words you could use for 2020, but it was it was one that in many ways, I, I mean, we're going to have a, a very unusual one this fall as well. But I think what one of the things that made 2020 so unusual, so weird was just how long it took to really get all the results. And, and that was a lot of that had to do with COVID, a lot of, you know, changes that year in, in some of the important swing states to their voting laws to allow for mail-in voting, to allow for extended early voting. And they just, in a lot of cases, they either had antiquated laws that they failed to update or they just had never gone through this before. And it created a process where they were, you know, the day after the election, they still hadn't counted millions of ballots. And it was a very, in some of those states, as you all remember, I'm sure it was a very, very slow process. So it was like like that Polaroid picture used to used to take where it would take a while to come into focus. You know, it was like on Tuesday, we see a little more Wednesday, a little bit more. And it really took till the end of the week till till Saturday morning to get the full picture. So I I just think it was, um, you know, and and I was in a position where I could kind of narrate that for people um, kind of blow by blow. And, um, you know, I I don't everyone remembers. I certainly do the, the 2000 election. You know, that night was was chaotic. It gets called for Bush. It gets, you know, called for Gore. It's all over the place. Uh, and Tim Russert was uh, was kind of the 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 the, um, the figure who kind of, you know, from the media side who really kind of emerged from that. And he had that famous whiteboard. The board, you know, yeah. What, it was a little simpler than what you do. A little, little I, bit simpler. It, it, <laughs> it was not that long ago, I tell people. But, uh, you know, again, that was sort of a, a chaotic, it was a chaotic night. And then it became something different for 40 days because it was just, a, it was a court case. But, in the case of 2020, it went on for, you know, for four nights, for five nights. Just uh, try to understand how your brain can do what it does. What astounds me is it'll be some random county in Vermont, and you just have a, just an encyclopedic knowledge of every county in every map. Uh, how did, explain how you, how you actually can do that. It seems almost inhuman. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, it's. It, I guess the thing is, I, I know a lot about a little and nothing about a lot. Yeah, like you didn't know who Taylor Swift was. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah. I mean, it's honest. I'm oblivious to. Right. I am oblivious to things that uh, that people are otherwise extremely familiar with. So it, you know, it just so happens for whatever reason. I do think my mind has always kind of, you know, worked well with or understood things through numbers. Um, I can remember that, you know, from a young age, just it, it would always help me understand something if I could put a number on it and compare it to something else, put a number on that. And it just helped me make sense of things, sort things out. And and that definitely, you know, I, when I was a kid, I was kind of applying that to sports, to box scores, to that sort of thing. And, you know, I got interested in politics and, you know, elections. It's a lot of the same kind of muscle memory if you're following, you know, uh, NBA box scores every day sure. or something. Which it, I do, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, so it's, it's a lot of that's. There's a lot of overlap there when you start looking at 
election stats. And, and I like it too. I, I, it, it's, it's fun because- Well, you handle it like a sporting event. I mean, to the point where they got you on Sunday Night Football, the Olympics. I mean, it's a horse race and you say that unapologetically. Yeah, no, because I, I think it's the one that I always tell people, you know, I, I feel like this this is an incredibly polarized era, tribalized is the word probably. Well, I mean, and, your, you know, your book really, you know, was a yeah, precursor well, yeah. for us, right? There's, there's, a, uh, there's a, a backdoor way to get a plug for my book in, but um, I hope at least that what I do is one of those like kind of islands that both sides can coexist on because the one thing they have in common is they each want to know if their side's winning. If their side's losing, what their side needs to do to win, why their side might be losing. And that's, you know, that's what I hopefully provide. My favorite Kornacki moment, and we get to catch them because there's Kornacki cam, was when I think it was Rachel went to you and said, Steve, we're, I asked a very obviously minutiae question and you had 90,000 papers on your desk. And so on the one hand, we got to see somebody who was just like us, oh my God, but then you just lasered in and somehow found the piece of paper and the piece of information. That was astounding. I, well, it was one of those, I remember, I think if I remember right, that was Arizona and they, they on election night, they released like two thirds of their vote right away and then the rest takes like five days. Yeah. So I, was, I knew this was going to be a thing when Arizona's polls closed. What that first report was in 2022 and I wanted to compare it to what that first report was in 2020 to see if there was any movement. So I knew I had written it down. I knew I had done the research. And and I also had that. I probably had about 60 pieces of paper there. And I was like, God, can I find this in the next 10 seconds? And it was a, it was a bit of luck. But I looked down and I was like, oh, yeah, there's the, there's the green pen. I know where it is. I love it. Let's get into the election a little bit. Uh, obviously, it looks like we know who our two candidates. Anything can happen in terms of uh, health or uh, obviously Trump's convictions and things. Like but you're seeing a lot of different dynamics in this election that we saw in 2020, particularly at the expense of Joe Biden. Yeah. I mean, the, the biggest difference is the obvious one. If you look at all the polling from 2019, 2020, Biden versus Trump. I mean, we we polled it. At NBC. He was up at like six percent at this point. Right. He right. never trip. Uh, yeah. Trump never trailed by fewer than six points in our poll. Biden. Biden. A uh, Biden. Right, right. No, no. Uh, Trump. Trump trailed. Yeah. Biden, yeah, led. Yeah, yeah, Biden yeah. never led by fewer than, than, uh, six, than six. Right. And the lead got as high as 14 in our polling. And that was we were no outlier. Everybody was finding you know the same thing. If you remember, there was a Wisconsin poll from uh, ABC about three weeks before the 2020 election that had Trump down 17 in that state. Yeah. He yeah. lost by 20,000 votes. So um, this time around, we're seeing polls, our own included, that have Trump ahead. And that's just that's like from a polling standpoint, that's uncharted territory. For yeah, Trump, yeah, for an incumbent and, an, and for an incumbent also to, to be this far down this this. I mean, to be down this far along. And that's I think that's the, the, the problem Biden and the Democrats are running up against here. It's like. It's the flip of the, of the roles here. Trump was the incumbent in 2020. Any frustration, any exasperation with him, Biden was just the obvious protest vehicle. Now there's frustration that exists with Biden as well. There's, there's dissatisfaction, deep dissatisfaction that exists with Biden. So in some ways, Trump is, is collecting all of that. You could certainly argue he's not collecting as much of it as a sort of generic Republican would because Trump has his own limitations, his own vulnerabilities, but he's definitely collecting some of it. And we're seeing some shifts, you know, younger voters, non-white voters, younger and non-white voters. We're seeing some shifts away from Biden and even toward Trump um, that really are kind of brand new. Yeah, his, his base is, that it's been talked a lot about, is shaky. Obviously, the Israeli, the Israeli war is hurting him with young people. It's hurting with people of color. Obviously, we've got Michigan, which uh, obviously is going to be such a crucial state with 300,000 Arab Americans. He's got his challenges the one thing that you said is interesting in the polls in that you think a lot of people are saying, OK, well, once Trump gets convicted, you know, in, in the South Carolina polls, 25 percent said it would disqualify him or make him, you know, unfit for office. You're saying maybe that in the polls, people are giving what they think is a politically correct answer, but might not just like many other times with Trump when we think there's a watermark, he yep. can't come back from you said, no, no, no. He just always goes back to the mean. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, there's two things that come to my mind, but the, the, the first one is just I kind of think we lived through this with Trump in his first campaign in 2016. Because I, I look at it this way. If, if you had taken a poll, let's say in the summer of 2016, and described the contents of the Access Hollywood tape <laughs> yeah. and said, you know, if this comes Disqualifying. Out, six, six, right. 90 percent of people would say no, it disqualifies right. him. Yeah. And you, right, who would you vote for, Clinton or Trump? Yeah. You know? And so then it did come out and, and it happened to be it was almost like a great political science experiment because it literally happened to come out the first day NBC was in the field with a poll in October 2016. And we saw this happen or the second day, I think it was, because we saw it happen where the first day 
Trump was down seven points to Clinton. That was kind of his standard deficit in 2016. And over the next two days, it exploded. I think it got as high as 19, came down a little bit in the third day. And on the final day, it was back at seven. Yeah. So it was like in the span of three days, Amazing. <laughs> these voters worked through all the motions and got back to baseline. And I almost, I, I, you know, until proven otherwise, I think I think that's my default assumption of what would happen, even if there's a, a felony conviction. And obviously the polls is Biden. We see so much. He's old. He's old. But beyond that, what is your take? And I don't know if there's anything. The numbers are going to show this, that why the good stuff doesn't stick. He's the unstickiest president in the entire world. You know, the, by most, just about every other economic metric other than inflation, and inflation has cooled. Uh, he's he's had a winning winning hand. Yet when it comes to the issues of economy, uh, he still gets horrible marks and gets beaten dramatically by Trump. I think one of the things I guess to keep in mind on, on inflation is even when it cools, even when it stabilizes, the prices don't go down. So I, I think, yeah. you know, when you talk about inflation, it's, it, it, it takes a while for, for the sting of that to kind of go away for people. So even if it is cooling now, I, I, I don't know that people are going to answer or immediately say, oh, yeah, this is great. Inflation is done because they're yeah, still yeah. remembering what it was yeah, they're still, three years They're still ago. paying 15% more than they used to pay, right? Right. So I, I mean, I think on inflation, that's, that's a big part of it. Um, and it's, it's also, you know, his, um, how do you say it? It's, it, it, it is like his public visibility is, is fairly limited and, and yeah. what, exactly what's going on there in terms of behind the scenes. I, I don't know, you know, whether that's related directly to age or anything, but I think his public visibility is limited. Yeah. That was and, a mistake keeping him out of the Super Bowl because that was a relatively, I mean, it would have been Gail King or, uh, or, um, uh, Nora O'Donnell, not an adversarial place to be. And the fact that they shut him down there was a, Bad signal to people. Really and I, I think it indicates, too, that they they see his his folks see 2024 as, in their view, they plan to repeat 2022. Yeah. You know, 2022 midterms when, you know. Everybody was in the base. Red yeah. Red, yeah, yeah. Fizzled. And, and what you saw ultimately were, you know, kind of there were swing voters out there who were ready to vote Republican. We saw this in some states, but they wouldn't vote for the Trump aligned Republican candidates in 2022. And so there's a, you know, I think the Biden folks think that when it comes to it, it may not be that the sale is is for Biden. It, it may just be that those voters look at Trump, can't do it, and go back to Biden. I think that is what they're banking on. You've also said abortion, although obviously a he, huge issue, will not be the issue the way it was uh, four years ago. But I, 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 I kind of find that counterintuitive being that we've had row overturns. So uh, right. I'm I, I say that because, I, look, it, I think it definitely matters when you're talking about a special election or any kind of election that has lower turnout than a presidential general election, which, which was 160 million people in, in right. 2020. But when it's lower turnout, um, which groups are most motivated really, really matters. And so I, Democrats have been excelling in all of these special, special elections. elections yeah. We said they had a very good 2022. So I, 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 you know, I do think, especially in special elections, it, it plays a role just from a motivation standpoint. But from a persuasion standpoint, I think the politics of abortion had largely sorted themselves out already. That is to say, the folks most activated and most motivated on the side of on the pro-choice side had already kind of sorted themselves behind Democratic candidates, the folks, folks most activated, motivated on the pro-life side, Republican candidates. And so I, the example that sticks in my head is 2022 in Georgia. Again, I think we had a really interesting test because you had two Republican candidates running statewide there. You had Brian Kemp, the incumbent governor, and you had Herschel Walker, the candidate mm -hmm. for Senate. And this was just months after Roe had been overturned. And they had the exact same position on abortion. You know, Kemp had signed the six week ban in Georgia and Walker said he supported it. And, and if you're a vo if you're voting on abortion, the one you care more about is the governor's race, because that's where the law is now coming from. It's at the state level. And yet Kemp won by almost 10 points and Walker lost. And I think the differentiating factor was Trump. It was the Trump factor yeah. because Walker was Trump's handpicked candidate. He was aligned at the hip, joined at the hip with Trump. And Kemp, meanwhile, was the guy who signed off on the 2020 election results in Georgia, set Trump on fire. He recruited you know, a former U.S. senator who challenged uh, Purdue in the Republican primary in 2022. Purdue beat him. And I think there was a voter there 
uh, in the suburbs of Atlanta, a voter that you know wanted to vote against the Democrats, and because Kemp was separate from Trump in their minds, they were happy to they, vote they were for happy Kemp. To do it. But they looked at Walker and they saw Trump, and they couldn't do they that. Couldn't do it. You talked about special election a couple of weeks ago. We had one uh, in the third district in New York, uh, where Swazi took Santos' seat, beat a what many thought was a very appealing Republican candidate. Uh, obviously, turnout was subdued because of the weather. But what else did you see in the in that election that could be a precursor for twenty twenty four? It gets again to that to that turnout question because there's the the folks and, and Roe contributed to this, but I, I do think that the, obviously the biggest contributor here has been Trump over the last eight nine years, and it's this type of voter that uh, it's college educated white voters is the is the simplest way to describe them. Often in the suburbs, often with higher incomes, you could you could qualify it a bunch of different ways. But college educated white voters, as a group, used to be a core Republican group, and even in 2012, voted for Mitt Romney by 14 points. Uh, over Barack Obama. Fast forward just eight years later, 2020, college educated whites voted for Joe Biden by 15 points. It's, it's a swing of nearly 30 points in just eight years. And that district, that third district of Long Island is chock full of white voters with college degrees. Right. I grew we, up in Bayside, Queens, right there next to Douglas. Okay, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. there's that north-south divide. Yeah. So it's interesting, the district, because the, the northern part of the district, which is the wealthier, more affluent, more yeah. college educated side, the five Long Island towns in the district with the highest concentrations of white college educated adults, all had turnout levels that were about 75% of the 2022 midterm level. The five Long Island towns with the lowest share of, of white uh, college educated voters had turnout levels that were about 55, 60% of 2022. Huge turnout disparity. And, and I think that made that was the single biggest factor there is that, that anti-Trump college educated suburban vote is just absolutely on fire right now. They're not waiting for general elections. They are looking no. for every and any election they can find to vote against Trump, to vote against the Republican Party. And in these lower turnout affairs, it's giving Democrats a huge, huge advantage. So some of the polls, and my friend Joe Scarborough was pushing back this morning on this saying, you know, I, I don't believe it. I think it's going to settle where it always does, is saying that Biden is really struggling with, with voters of color. Um, the African-American vote. What are you seeing in the cross tabs that's telling you that's happening and why? I mean, so it's definitely happening, you know, with Hispanic voters. And, and we established that in 2020 when Trump made huge, huge strides. Yeah. And, and it was you know, particularly South Florida, particularly the border in Texas. But it wasn't just there. We, I could give you examples in totally non-competitive states where you saw that. We saw that number that Trump kind of attained in 2020 with Latinos basically stabilize in 2022. So it didn't go back to the Democrats, but it didn't increase further. Now in our polling, we're seeing it increase further. Our most recent NBC poll among Latinos, we have it tied. Um, so that, I mean, again, this is a group that was- Democrats uh, Democrats are not winning an election if they're tying them into the Hispanic vote. I mean, it's yeah, that simple. That's, I mean, yeah. And, and, that's, and you're, what you're also seeing, I think, that's alarming to Democrats, you know, definitely for 24, but really big picture, longer term, is that this- this? That's where uh, the growth is, yeah. Well, yeah, and, and what we've seen among white voters, what I was just describing, this, this gap between white college-educated, Democratic- white non-college, increasingly Republican, that divide, we're now starting to see that among Hispanic voters, where you have Hispanic voters without college degrees, that swing to Republicans is a lot more dramatic. Hispanic voters with college degrees, it's a lot less dramatic. But since Democrats were winning overwhelmingly with the Hispanic vote before all this, any slippage is bad news for them. And if the non-college component of the Hispanic vote folds into the Republican tent, that's a huge net loss for Democrats. And some of the polls have uh, the African-American vote at 20%. It's hard to describe any group as a monolithic vote, but what are you seeing there that's causing that? Yeah, I'm, I take that one more skeptically and, and as much less kind of proven than the Hispanic vote because yeah. we, every election, it seems, we do see polls that will- And then it goes back to right. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12%. Right? Yeah, there's not since, you got to go back to 1960 to find a Republican presidential candidate who won 20% or more of yeah. the black vote. And it not yeah. even, generally not even close. Yeah. But to the extent that there is a shift there or maybe a shift there, the place I would look is a gender divide, you know, black men versus black women, because if, if, we just see this in general, men moving more towards, you know, the Republican party and, and women going the opposite direction. And if you start to see that same degree gap I'm talking about, you know, with whites and Hispanics, does that start to emerge, you know, in the black community as well? But that's less... That's more theoretical. It could happen. And if it does, it's significant, but it's more theoretical. Let's put on the soothsayer uh, Kornacki hat. If you were going to say, if I was going to say, give me a state or two that 
is a swing state we see it as, but you see it maybe not being a swing state. And conversely, something that is either traditionally entrenched blue or red that may turn into a swing state. Do you see any surprises on the state level as far as swing state, non-swing state? I mean, uh, swing state, non-swing state. Yeah, I, I don't see any huge shocks. I don't know if this one counts as a surprise anymore, but I, the one that I've been keeping an eye on is Nevada, you yeah. know, which, you know, has did not vote for Trump in 16 or 20, but he did bring the margin down to two and a half points each time. And that's one of those places there's a lot of white voters without college degrees. And that's a place where, you know, his campaign believes if this further growth with Hispanics is real, Nevada flips. So that's the, the most obvious one that 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 it was never a Trump state in 16 or 20 that could become one. Um, and on the on the other side, in, in terms of Biden pulling in any new territory from 20, you know, I, I, I can't really see that. The one that what's interesting is Trump, if he's going to get to three, if he's going to get to 270, barring something totally rabbit out of the hat, he's got to win one of those three, you know, Midwest. Must Pennsylvania. Belt states, right. And, and the one that, that I think is most interesting right now is Michigan. Sure. Yeah. Um, and it, for the reasons you were saying, and it's interesting because while Trump won Michigan in 16, it really, of all those three, swung the hardest back to Democrats in 2020. It, was yeah, it went from 10,000 votes uh, to Trump to a couple hundred thousand, right. I think, over the Biden, right? Right. And yet the polling now pretty consistently out of there is 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 some you know alarm signs for uh, for Biden. So if, how if much of that is the how much of that is the Arab American vote? I think it, I think it, it, it could be. Um, and, you know, that's that's a variable that exists. It's kind of a Michigan specific variable. Um, but it's also, you know, there is a very large non-white college population there, um, you know, in Michigan, those small counties, you know, north of uh, Saginaw, north of Bay City. They're individually tiny, but they add up. And we saw Trump gain, you know, 20, 30 points over Romney there if they're really on fire for turnout. You know, and then the other, you know, Democrats aren't getting what they used to out of Detroit. You know, the population in Detroit has dropped so much, but yeah. Democrats also, you know, there, there are some turnout potential signals of turnout trouble for them, um, you know, in places like Detroit among, you know, particularly among black voters. Um, and if that materializes and the balance, you know, the, the balance of the electric shifts a bit in the white non-college direction makes a big difference. Without Michigan, what's Biden's path? Got to win. I think for him, then he'd have to win an Arizona or a Georgia. And both of, you know, he won Arizona by, I think, 9,700 votes. And he won, you know, Georgia by, you know, 11,000 plus in, right. uh, in 2020. Very, very slim margins. And in each state, you know, it was a pretty big deal that a Democrat won them. But I guess if you look at it from, from the Electoral College standpoint, you know, Biden got 306 in 2020. Now, the first thing that happens is we had uh, the census, you reapportion, states have different Electoral College amounts. So under the new map, the exact same result state by state now would give Biden only 303 electoral votes. Interesting. I work, didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. That and if, yeah. if you work backwards from that, you know, and you take, um, you take like, uh, take an Arizona out, 303 becomes 292. Take Georgia out, 292 becomes 276. Then you take any one of those Midwestern states out. That's it. And you're, you're under that number. So I, yeah, I think he's got to then hang on to one of those two. What do you see? Well, a stat that blew me away is that voters 18 to 34 are now kind of evenly split Republican and Democrat. Uh, I, I almost fell off my chair when I saw that. It's another one, you know, there's a, to the extent it's real, it's gender. And it's, it's young males shifting in, in pretty surprised numbers to Trump and to the Republicans. And it's young females who were already, you know, extremely Democratic becoming probably on the whole more democratic, but they, there's not as much room for growth there for Democrats because they were already so democratic. So that's the thing you're seeing in the polling now, whether I'm skeptical, whether you'll actually see like a tie race among young voters in November. But if, if Trump even, you know, cuts, you know, makes inroads there, it's all, it's all a bonus for him because that was such a lost demographic. We, we look at the polls and we all, caveat and say they're just polls it's a snapshot and take them for what they're worth you've already laid out one thing in a poll that you're suspect about as far as trump's uh vulnerability being a conviction that people what other answers are you seeing in polls now that are telling us something that you go i really got a skeptical eye of that Let, let's watch and see how that happens well i think just a, a lot of these things we're talking about when it comes to young voters um as we said when it comes to non-white voters i, I think the thing is this what, so what i was just describing a few minutes ago this democratic turnout edge in the special elections. 
we know that that segment of the electorate, white college educated Democratic, is absolutely on fire. And we know that Democrats can count on every last one of them to turn out in November. A lot of these groups where, where Trump is showing some surprising strength, it's on the backs in polls of voters who aren't turning out in special elections, who didn't turn out in the 2022 midterm election. But, you know, presidential elections, is that's the one, you know, that brings mm-hmm. almost, the, doesn't bring everybody out, but brings the most people out. So the, the Trump campaign, to make these polls a reality, is counting on a voter who, it's a one in four voter at best. Once every four years, they vote. And some of them, not even that. And that's what the Trump campaign is hoping for. So they're, they're, the polls I, you know, are, are showing what they're showing, and it's different. But to make the polls a reality, it's going to require turnout uh, from voters who currently you know, aren't turning out. And, and that the one, I think, big variable hanging over all of this is just what is the overall turnout going to be in this election? Because we say it was 160 million in 2020, which is just an astronomical level. I can't see it being less. Right. I mean, I, well, I, I, see I, see it. I think there's some evidence it will be less. Really? Yeah. And it's, we're in a strange situation that we're not- I guess to. so. Yeah. As I, as I talked to you out loud, there's a lot of disenfranchised voters. They don't like either choice. So yep. yeah, I, that was stupid of me to say. Yeah. No, it, I mean, it's, I, it's at this point, it's counterintuitive because we're used to everybody being yeah. super, super political. And I don't think it'll be low, but I, I suspect it could be lower you know, than 2020 by a fair amount. And the new dynamic that we're not used to is- as I just said, the Republicans are the ones now who benefit, it would seem, from the higher turnout. The Democrats, with this core base I'm describing, the lower the turnout gets, the more influence that core base is going to have. So I think that's the big X factor. How much does that turnout fall from 20? And if it, there's, I don't know what the number is, but at a certain level, if it falls enough, there's a real turnout advantage there for Democrats from that, that college-educated block I'm talking about. There's one issue that, to me, is such a... Uh hard issue to get your arms around. And to me, it's the issue, democracy. But I find when I talk to people, even very educated people, and I say, you know, our democracy is online. Do you understand if Trump wins? And I'll start to go through a litany of things of how the world could and would change. I don't think that's hitting with the average voter. I think to your earlier point, they're looking at their grocery bills. How do the Democrats make that an issue that matters? Yeah, again, I, I don't think it's really a persuasion issue because, I mean, again, our, our most recent poll, we we went through a whole set of issues and said, who would you prefer on issue X? And on, I, I think we phrased it protecting democracy or it might have just been democracy, but it was a democratic advantage of two points. <laughs> That's so you just, insane. That's so you, insane. That's so insane. What it, what it shows you, though, is that it's, it, depending on where you are I, kind yeah. of politically, you, you, you just interpret that question and that issue very differently. So when it comes to that, I do think, and I do think we saw this in 22 in the midterms, that was a motivating issue for those those voters I was describing, like in Georgia, who could vote for Kemp, but who couldn't vote for Walker. Mm-hmm. I think January 6th had an awful lot to do with that. And, you know, that's, that is a thing that, that, you know, Democrats are counting on being a thing in 24 as well, keeping that same voter away from Trump and and maybe, as I said, if there's if the turnout is not hitting the, the 160 million level, maybe that type of voter is a little more influential than they were in 2020. If you could right now see three counties and say, if I saw the numbers in these three counties right now, I could really get a handle on where the world's going to be. What, what were those three counties you'd like to see right now? That if ah, if I saw this there, I know then X is Y. The, the obvious one in Arizona is Maricopa County. Right. And it's, it makes up more than half the state. And when Biden won it in 2020, he was the first Democrat to win it since 1948. So, yeah, if, if Biden's not winning Maricopa again, he's not winning Arizona. Right. Um, I think in Michigan, there's a couple places. Um, I guess the one that I'd be most interested in is Macomb County. That's the, the big blue collar suburb north of Detroit. There's two, there's two big suburban counties next to each other, Macomb and Oakland. Oakland's the white collar. Right. Macomb is the blue collar. Now, Trump flipped. It was, Macomb had been going Democratic and Trump flipped it in 16. And he still won it in, in 2020, but by a little smaller margin. So I think Macomb is sort of a test for Trump. Can he jack up the margin in Macomb County from where it was in, uh, in 2020? And I think that will go a long way to answering the Michigan question. And I think this Nevada question. Well, you know, I won't say Nevada because the reality with Nevada is it's six electoral votes and it's 
actually kind of hard to construct an electoral college scenario where Nevada becomes the swing state. Right, right. Um, so I think then you do have to look, you probably do have to look at Georgia and, you know, which one of those counties, um, it's one of those sort of counties right outside of Atlanta, right outside of Fulton County. The one that flipped, mo- they've all been becoming more and more democratic population yeah. changes, population growth. The one that flipped the most recently Republican to Democrat is just uh, southwest of Atlanta, Fayette County. Mm-hmm. And so I think I look at that one. Does that does that flip back? Okay, it's, all right. Last question. And I, I, I know what your answer is going to be. And I'm not asking you to predict the election because it's not what you do and no would you do it. But if you look at everything right now, as a snapshot today, what you're seeing in polls, what you know about polls, Steve Kornacki, how would you handicap the election today based on what you are seeing today, based on even your skepticisms? And we'll put it all in that bowl. Are yeah. we 50-50? Are we 52-48? Well, where, where, where do you, if I was to ask you to handicap it, I put it, there's an expression, gun to your head. You know, gun to your head, you got to make the call. <laughs> what I've been telling people is, you know, it, it sounds like a cop out, but it's a coin toss. That, yeah. That's how, yeah. how I, I knew you were going to say it. It kind of yeah. is. I mean, it, you know, there's no yeah, other way to do bold, it. Yeah. With, the, with the bold with picks. With the bold you know, predictors, but. it's a coin toss. No, I, I, by the way, I say the same thing to people, and I don't have 100th of the knowledge you have. You just, everything you feel, and you, you feel. I, what I believe, though, is that we are going to live through history. The combination of the trials, what's going on with age, maybe one of them has a health issue. I just think the world is going to shift a bunch of times in ways we haven't seen it shift between a February and a November. I just, it's just my gut. That's my, as a behaviorist, I see unforeseen things that could, that are going to just change the landscape as we see it now. I don't see it's going to be as it is now. No, I, I, I think it's going to be an eventful <laughs> nine, yeah. uh, and eight months here. And, um, and yeah, there are just there are variables at play in this election outside of all the demographic stuff we're talking about right here. There are bigger picture variables that we just haven't seen. I mean, it, it, you talk about age. Um, I mean, the combined age of these two candidates four years ago was a lot. Now, now yeah. it's even more the, the 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 novelty of a defeated former president coming back mm-hmm. trying to you know win the, the, the job back. You haven't seen that. In, 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 it, there's no modern example that we can really say learn anything from. You got to go too far back pre-media age to, to see that. So there's that. There's the legal ch- stuff around Trump. There's, yeah, th- there are huge variables here that um, you, you I lo- I'm the kind of person that loves to look back and say, okay, I think we've seen this before. Mm-hmm. Here's what we can learn from it. I think we've seen this. And, and I have a hard time with some of these things, finding anything we, we, we can point to in the past and say, ah, there's a way to understand it. Steve Kornacki, you are so spectacular at what you do. There are very few people I think are irreplaceable. You're one of them. I don't know when your deal is up with NBC, but hold them up for a lot of money <laughs> uh, because you are priceless. And thanks for all you do for us. You, you're, you're just great great at your craft, and you up up the whole game for everybody. Uh, Donnie, thanks a lot. I'm going to clip that last line and send it to me. <laughs> send it to Rashid, okay? <laughs> Stay well, my friend. Thank you so much. I'll see you on Morning Joe. Everybody, thanks for watching. If you like it, hit that subscribe button. And we love having you here watching On Brand. And just don't miss any future episodes. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.